could take place and take place successfully because, as our friends from Saigon said in their part of the Declaration of Honolulu, we are a government, indeed a generation, of revolutionary transformation. And as I looked across the table at these brave and determined young men, I thought also of the young Vietnamese soldiers and province chiefs and teachers and student leaders who are really a part of this new generation. They know, and we know, that this revolutionary transformation cannot wait until the guns grow silent and until the terrorism stops. On Friday, February the 4th, 1966, President Johnson had startled the world with a sudden announcement. In less than 24 hours, he would be on his way to Honolulu for three days of briefings with Premier Nguyen Cao Ki and other members of the government of South Vietnam. While he was there, he would also meet with General William C. Westmoreland, commander of all United States forces in Vietnam. No, the announcement, as abrupt as it seemed, signaled no military crises or policy change by the administration. By late afternoon of the following day, as Air Force One raced across the Pacific, it had become evident to many that President Johnson's plans extended far beyond the military strategy of the war in Vietnam. For traveling with him, or en route separately, were cabinet officers and other United States officials from many disciplines, ranging from the military and diplomatic to the educational, medical, and agricultural fields. For these men and their president, this trip would provide more than just a cursory glance at the problems in Vietnam. Theirs would be a wide-ranging examination and study of the military, political, and economic conditions surrounding the war. By facing up to and challenging each one of these conditions, President Johnson hoped to bring his nation's goals and the war itself into clearer perspective. By 6.39 p.m. Hawaii time, 11 hours after takeoff from Andrews Air Force Base, Air Force One touched down at Honolulu's International Airport. On hand to greet the president were members of Hawaii's congressional delegation, Hawaii's Governor John Burns, General and Mrs. William Westmoreland, and Pacific Commander-in-Chief Admiral U.S. Grant Sharp, Jr., who would act as host to the forthcoming conferences. Although this was the president's first trip outside of the North American continent since entering the White House, the surprise visitor among the imposing array of officials appeared to be Kathy Westmoreland. Kathy, daughter of General and Mrs. Westmoreland, and a student at Washington's National Cathedral School, had been spirited aboard Air Force One by President Johnson for a weekend visit with her parents, courtesy of the White House. On Sunday morning, the president accepted an invitation from Governor Burns to attend religious services at St. Augustine's Catholic Church. Then, as always, it was time to meet the people. And later, enjoy a rare treat for an early day in February, an ice cream sundae in 70 degree temperature. They had met only once before. Now, after two years of long distance communication, President Johnson and General Westmoreland sat face to face and talked unflinchingly about the military problems of the undeclared war in Vietnam. Not long afterward, one official would say that the results of this meeting alone were worth all the tons of jet fuel poured into the entire conference. The conclusions? The administration would do everything within its power to help South Vietnam build the sort of society it wanted, free from external interference. 
To accomplish this, additional troops as needed would be supplied as General Westmoreland required them. By that evening, the delegation from Saigon, headed by Premier Key, Chief of State Van Tu, and Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge, arrived at Honolulu International. To these beautiful islands, and the newest of our states have come the leaders of South Vietnam and the United States. Come here to talk of our resolution to defend the peace and to build a decent society for the people of South Vietnam. Our stand must be as firm as ever. If we allow the communists to win in Vietnam, it will become easier and more appetizing for them to take over other countries in other parts of the world. We will have to fight again someplace else. At what cost, no one knows. Because we are here to talk especially of the works of peace, we will leave here determined not only to achieve victory over aggression, but to win victory over hunger and disease and despair. Mr. President, your words have gone beyond the usual welcoming address, for they have told Vietnam and the world of a renewed and much stronger determination on the part of the United States to draw a line and stop communist aggression in Vietnam and now. Formal sessions of the Honolulu Conference began on Monday morning, February 7th, at Camp Smith, the United States Pacific Command headquarters overlooking Pearl Harbor. Now, as the leaders of South Vietnam and the United States came together for the first time, the greatest American commitment since Korea hanging in the balance, the feasibility of one question remained to be answered. Could a war be fought successfully within a country, while at the same time the country was being rebuilt? From the very outset, President Johnson stressed that military problems would continue to be of major importance, but that while they were there, they would also talk of other things. We talked of many very special and specific things. We talked of rural construction, of agricultural credits, of rural electrification, of new seeds and fertilizers for their crops, of schools and teachers and textbooks for their children, of medical schools and clinics and equipment to give them better health, of how to give training and education to the refugees, of how to deal with inflation in a war-torn country, of how to build the basis for 
a democratic constitution and for free elections of how to seek the peace and of how to effectively conduct the war. The United States and the Republic of Vietnam would continue to fight until an honorable peace could be negotiated. And they would also launch a stepped up program of social, economic, and political reforms even as the war went on. To achieve these goals, a series of seminars and working sessions between American and Vietnamese officials on agricultural, social, educational, and rural construction programs had been set up. Progress achieved by these groups during the day was the subject of a further press conference that evening. Even before the tenor of the press conferences and meetings had died away, President Johnson and a small cadre of his advisors had secluded themselves for private talks with Premier Key and Chief of State Nguyen Van Tu. This meeting would continue unabated, even after a power failure had thrown the Royal Hawaiian Hotel into temporary darkness. war room came to a close over a quiet supper with the Americans and their Vietnamese counterparts still talking of crops, classrooms, highways, and hospitals. On Tuesday, February the 8th, the conference sessions came to a close with the signing of the four article Declaration of Honolulu. The South Vietnamese vowed to continue the fight against the communists by building a stable and viable economy around a true democracy. In the months ahead, they would formulate a democratic constitution which they would take to their people. And on the basis of the elections provided for in that constitution, they would seek free elections. The United States, in turn, would remain pledged to the principle of self-determination for the people of Vietnam. They would lend full support to the fight against hunger, ignorance, and disease, even as the war went on and they would continue, as they had in the past, to press for an honorable and peaceful settlement. From the very beginnings of the conference, President Johnson had been surprised and deeply impressed by Premier Key's determination and political awareness. Now in their final moments together, they talked of the weeks and months ahead. So that immediate steps in a rural welfare program could get underway, the President had asked Secretary of Agriculture, Orville Freeman, and a staff of nine agricultural experts to accompany Premier Key on his return to Saigon. By the following morning, the group would be joined by Vice President Hubert Humphrey. And so, two men from the opposite ends of the globe parted company. They would meet again within three to six months to measure the progress that had been made. But for the time being, they parted knowing that the war in Vietnam was no longer isolated in a military vacuum. It was a war that could be won, but only when the Vietnamese people, indeed the people of the entire world, had the opportunity to be liberated from poverty, ignorance, and exploitation.
Los Angeles International Airport, Tuesday evening, February the 8th. Missions will follow that have been organized by Secretary Gardner in the fields of education, in the fields of health, and in other fields where our people can help with the work of social construction in South Vietnam. The distinguished Vice President is leaving Los Angeles immediately to carry forward the mission that we outlined and we agreed upon and we defined at this very unusual conference in Honolulu. The Vice President will go from Saigon to other capitals in Asia to explain what was done at Honolulu and the real meaning of our work there. We shall fight the battle for social construction. And throughout the world, we shall fight the battle for peace. And to the American people who have given us their strength in every hour of trial, I say to you that we shall fight all of these battles successfully, and we shall prevail.